right, 97.7 Outlaw Radio FM listeners, you already know what time it is. And right here, right now, we actually have a phenomenal, legendary individual that has done phenomenal things for the hip-hop community. She is formerly of Def Jam Recordings and, of course, The Source Magazine, and the list goes on. We have Jazz Young right here, live on the line. How are you doing this evening? I am super. What's up, Canada? Thank you so much for having me. I feel honored. I feel blessed, and I'm so excited on this Friday night, and I'm ready to rock and roll. I got to say, I am definitely blessed to be able to chop it up and just and just talk to a legendary individual like yourself, because a lot of individuals think it's just the artist that does everything, but without individuals like yourselves, a lot of these projects would not have even seen the light of day. Insane, right? And I always say that. When we are working on these projects or when you are just in the throes of it, you never realize that these projects are going to become legendary or part of history. So I'm grateful to be able to tell my story. And also, speaking of just uh, telling your story, from 1994 to 2003, you were actually director of marketing and product product management at uh, Def Jam. I was wondering, how did you originally land that position uh, with that company in 1994? Oh, my goodness. So I am this little girl, this little black girl from South Jamaica, Queens, in New York. And I had a passion, one, to be in the music industry, but another passion to go to Howard University. And so, you know, I didn't have any, like, way of getting there. I just knew that I had to get there. So when I got to Howard University, um, we know it was the first checklist, the first thing off of the checklist, I was just hustling, doing everything and being involved in everything just so that I could um, get to where I wanted to go, right? And so the story goes, I saw a sign one day that said, do you want to work in the music business? And a guy named Kevin Mitchell, who was the regional director at the time for Jeff Jam, um, you know, rallied up a bunch of us and we started to hustle, right? We started to just do everything in the mid-Atlantic region, which is Washington, D.C., you know, the DMV, um, Maryland, and Virginia. And then um, I started to get the hang of it. I started to understand the process. And then the following summer, I got the opportunity to actually intern at Def Jam Records. So this is like 91, 92, around that way. And then um, I got the opportunity to work at, Um, Elizabeth Street, which was one of the most legendary locations of Def Jam, right? Um, Just Lior Cohen and Julie Greenwald and Chris Lighty, God bless his his soul, and basically, um, you know, learn and intern from from them. There was Michael Kaiser, um, Big West at that location, Lytro, who worked with the Tribe Called Quest. Everyone was there. Like, you know, all of these hip-hop legends. And I found it to be a blessing. Um, The the next year, I was graduating from from college, and I sent in my resume, you know, and Lear Cohen told Julie, get the girl, get the girl, the one that interned for us last year. And then um, Julie Greenwald, who you know now is the president and CEO of We Are, right, Um, hired me at Jeff Jam, and literally the rest is history. And obviously, because you you mentioned that you were just you were in college when you started interning. So if you don't be asking, because I know this is probably a cliche kind of question, but I'm actually curious because I obviously you were very young at the time. So obviously, being able to intern and whatnot at Def Jam Records, was there any artists that actually walked past you that you actually got starstruck with very early on in your in your career within the music industry? And I don't know whether I got starstruck, but I was so excited to. Um, so I want to say it was. Homecoming, 1993, while I was at Howard University, right? Um, I was the volunteer coordinator for our staff members and our volunteers. And I had the opportunity. I had gotten Def Jam Records to actually host, um, you know, make the T-shirts for us, right? And they made these T-shirts, and I had all these, you know, staff members running all around. And one of the events for Homecoming Week during that year was the hip-hop show. And... It was just happened to be the year that um, Puffy brought Biggie there and Tupac was on the stage. And basically, it was just like a life, that was a life-changing year for me, right? 
One, because, well, I didn't even, you know, you don't know this in the history back then, but, oh, my gosh, could you imagine me seeing that firsthand? And it became a, a scene, obviously, from Biggie's movie, and I always tell people that I was literally right there be, beside the stage uh, when that scene happened. And, you know, when everyone thought for party and bullshit, when everyone thought it was a fight on stage and it was just a part of, you know, the artistry. And it was just an insane year for me that literally changed or literally helped to direct the trajectory of my entire life. It was like, oh, my God, I'm, I need to be like, this is who I am. Like, oh, my gosh. And from there began, you know, the upward or I would say the road, the journey to today. So that was one of the, like, craziest, most amazing times I've ever experienced in life. And I could just say, just being, just, just hearing that story and being able to, just like you said, being able to see that with your own eyes. A lot of individuals, a lot of fans would only be able to dream of being able to see that. But you actually witnessed history in the making right there before your eyes. I, I, I wish I could I'd take a DeLorean back and actually just be able to witness that. It was absolutely insane. Like, no words to describe that. Like, I've, I've been, you know, literally around the world. I've been on tour with DMX. I've been, you know, I've done all of those JV projects. I've worked with, you know, the greats, and I'm grateful for that. And all of those experiences now, as I start to tell them, right, as they start to become iconic, as they start to become history, right, uh, I'm, I'm even like, wow, right? Um, I told a story the other day about Daisy's first billboard cover and how they um, had offered him, like, a multi-cover with, like, other artists, and he was just like, no, like, I am Jay-Z. And, you know, and, and he, that was his first billboard cover, and I appreciate, you know, the, the leadership and artistry of all the artists that I worked with. Um, I literally just post, uh, posted on um, Instagram, right, 30, well, not 30 years, but just a bunch of um, pictures, but my relationship and my friendship with, with hip-hop, icon, right, with, with, with um, entertainment icon, Slick Rick. And I just looked in awe because you know how, like, um, the, the phone makes up the memories for you? And it just made a reel for me, like a, a bunch of memories with Slick Rick. And I literally just posted it because it made me think, like, wow, to have been friends with this and family, and he's the godfather to my kids, right? This legend, but we take him, you know, and I never want to take those relationships for granted, but we take him as Uncle Rick, but he's a whole global icon that has an album coming out with Idris Elba. So those moments make me go, wow. And also as well, in 1997, you actually had the opportunity to do uh, marketing and uh, promotion, actually, on EPMD's album, Back in Business. I was wondering, for what you actually can recall, can you tell our listeners a bit more about that? And, of course, what was it like being able to do marketing for this particular project? I am honored to have relationships that span over, you know, 30 years. I met EPMD when I was an intern at Def Jam. So, actually, to be able to work those projects you know, is mind-blowing, right? Once again, that historic point that we talk about, I still work with EPMD to this day, and then that's a blessing as well. And I think that, you know, uh, hip-hop hip -hop is hip-hop, but icons are, like, you know, very different, and, and, and not a lot of people can say that they are actually hip-hop icons. So as I remember, um, I just remember the, the artistry of, um, you know, Eric and Parrish, and, and how they are, you know, razor, like, I want to see razor focused on their lyrics, their design, their flow, and that, you know, and, and many people bit their flow. Many people, you know, emulated them over the years. So to work and see them in their true elements and then be able to even, you know, they made music back then that we still can listen to and celebrate now which is, like, the most incredible thing in the world. So for me to have worked on those projects and then, you know, all of these years still have a relationship with them, they are performing at the Kennedy Center in Washington, D.C. Um, on November 19th, um, and that is 
you know, crazy. And then for them to be to go get on stage now in 2022 and perform those perform those songs that they made, you know, back then, 92, 96, 97, and they still be relevant, that's how amazing and incredible hip-hop is and the culture is. I got to say, I definitely agree. I still listen to Back in Business like it came out yesterday. I actually remember, remember my CD actually has kind of like a purple uh, a, a purple uh, back of it. You know when you put the disc in, like the part the laser hits? Mine's actually purple. I don't know how... How it got like that, but it's one of the coolest scenes wow. I actually own. You have to send me a picture of that. You have to. I think that's amazing. I'm going to share it with the guys. I'll share it with Paris tonight. But at the end of the day, can you imagine, you know, looking at all of those um, those historical covers and the fact that now, obviously, they don't make CDs like they used to anymore. Those are collector's items. And then those things that you could, you know, half for generations to come at this point. What a blessing. I always say that, you know, hip-hop, it, it makes me feel like what a time to be alive. And speaking of that, after I, after we get off the air, I'll actually dig to dig through the closet and actually pull out my crate. I got, like, crates of, like, old-school hip-hop CDs, so it will take me a few moments, but I'll definitely get that CD out after I get off the air. I love it. And thanks again for having me. I am so grateful to just bond with you and your listeners. Congratulations on all of your success. I appreciate, you know, you just calling on little old me um, to just speak to, and thank you so much for doing your, your work and, and, and really having a true and meaningful conversation about hip-hop, and I'm honored. And also, can I do? Uh, you, I gotta say, you are most certainly welcome, Jazz. Honestly, truthfully, the, the honor. I gotta say, you, you, you're making me feel kind of blushy over here. But at the end of the day, I gotta say, it's definitely an honor to speak to you, uh, because at the end of the day, you were with Def Jam. You know, I've 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 never been signed, so. <laughs> I get you, but the hip hop. You know, um, you love hip hop. The hip hop community needs, you know, these radio shows. The, the hip hop community needs a show, continuous showcases of the culture. So I appreciate it. And Def Jam, it was like, like I said, we never knew that, you know, Def Jam was going to be Def Jam, right? Um, and it was just like, I was just happy to be a part of, you know, this this culture, this movement, because it was just something that was in my blood from early on. And the fact that, you know, I guess when you look back now, I, I see myself walking into Def Jam on that very first day, you know, hearing Leo Cohen screaming down the halls, um, we sharing one computer, me going um, where, just places with Russell Simmons and running his errands and just seeing the, the manifestation, you know, all these years now and how hip-hop has has grown, evolved, and changed. It's a part of the culture of mainstream, you know, America and Canada and the world, which is crazy. And I, I was saying the other day that I remember that we, we had to fight to get hip-hop in the doors. We literally had to fight and kick down doors to get hip-hop, you know, to be, one, believable, one, respected as, uh, you know, a culture, two, three, respected as, um, you know, a, a viable business. So, so all of these years later now, when, you know, you can't turn on the radio or the TV or a, a, a um, serial commercial, right, without hip-hop being a part of that, that's what I call growth. Just honored at this point, you know? And also as well, because I do know you mentioned a few moments ago about how you had, had the opportunity to work with DMX, and i got to say, you worked on pretty much every single DMX album from when he was signed to Def Jam Records. I was wondering if you can actually just tell our listeners a bit more about your time working with the late great DMX, and of course, what was it like just being in the studio with him? Everybody always, everyone always asks me, um, you know, what was the highlight of your career, or um, what is the highlight of your career? Who, which artist do you know, do you love the... I love all of the artists that I've worked with, and I'm grateful for every single experience because they are all, you know, a part of a part, their own iconic part of hip-hop history, right? Um, but the day that, that Leo Cohen signed um, BMF is another day that my life changed. And, and for those of us who have um, BET and BET Plus, our Murder, Inc. documentary launched on um, today, right? Today... Um, or yesterday on uh, BET Plus. So you can definitely 
hear my story and part of you know part of my story obviously, but you can see um, you know all the highlights of DMX in that era. But I, to answer your question, I say that I love at like I love him. You know how you work with someone, but then you love someone. I love this man. Um, you know, and he shared the same sentiments. Everyone always said that I was his person. You know how like a dog has their person. Everyone says. I was DMX's person. Uh, we had been, you know, up and down, through it all, um, through signing, through tours, through our children, through everything. Um, it it bro- literally broke my heart when he died, and I just feel like, you know, his legacy, he was so amazing that his legacy will live on. Uh, but to answer your question, I feel like, again, it was one of those situations where you know that you're working on some, something so great. And I think he was talented in every way. X was one of those people that, you know, didn't quite care about the glitz and the glory. He remained the same person, you know, just, you know, throughout his career. So whether it was 30 million records or 5 million records or 500, it was just always, he always remained X. He was the type of person that was so great. Well, first of all, he didn't care, right? He just had this passion for rap. So you know how, like, um, like, Prophets and, and those biblical people are that don't care about worldly things. Really, I believe that that's who he was, right? And I feel like at the end of the day, he was so righteous and so um, called of God. Like, I've seen him say grace over a pack of M&Ms. How dare us, right? How dare us? And I just feel like, you know, just looking back at his career, he was so anointed. And what happened was um, the very last time I saw him alive, he was doing a video um, in New York, and he called me um, thanks to Charlene Thomas at Def Jam and said, um, where are you at? I'm coming. And I was like, no, where are you? I'm, I'll come to you. I literally, you know, hopped in my car, went to go meet him, and um, we both cried, like literally cried. And I told him that, you know, his life was so was so called. Um, there was a calling on his life. And, you know, he had so much work to do, but I didn't realize that God was, te- was saying that his legacy would live on, right? I just assumed that it was him. And because, you know, of his life and because of his death, you know, people's lives have changed. It created a more awareness of self-worth, self-knowledge, right? And just living life because then you realize your life is so short. So at the end of the day, you know, I thank him for his contributions not only to hip-hop, but I also thank him for his contributions, you know, to, to mankind and Christianity. Literally, like what rappers do you know that would get on and have a prayer on every one of their albums and mean it? And literally will go on stage and be like, God, if one person gets touched, I know that I've done your work. And I feel like he celebrated God, honored God. Um, and brought God to the mainstream when other rappers were so scared to do that, and then other other people were talking about, you know, hell. So I feel like, you know, he was called to much is, to much, whom much is given, much is required, and I feel like, you know, I, I, I never questioned God. But at the end of the day, I'm grateful to be in the midst, right, to be in the midst of such a life-changing um Are you still there? Oh, oh, my, my apologies, Jazz. Mhm. No problem. Did you hear me? I just said I just was so excited to be in the midst of such a life-changing, um, you know, rapper. Um, he he was just excited about, you know, his craft and just didn't care otherwise. Just grateful. Yeah. And before we move off the topic of DMX, I do know as well that you were actually the executive producer for the motion picture soundtrack for his movie uh, that he actually did alongside uh, Jet Li, uh, Cradle to the Grave. I was wondering, what, what, uh, what is the story behind that project? And of course, what actually made you decide to venture into the producing aspect of the music industry? Thank you so much. That was a great question. Um, I have worked for Death Jam Records for a very long time. And DMX actually, they, they awarded him a label based on his work, and it was called Bloodline. Bloodline was a place for, oh, my God, the wildest of wildest of times. 
but X just signed who he wanted to sign, right, in, in terms of creativity, in terms of pushing things out, and just, you know, people he liked. And um, what happened was during that time, um, per his agreement with, you know, Joe Silver, we were able to, you know, Bloodline was able to, quote, unquote, have this soundtrack, right? And I had spent literally almost every day on set, um, you know, with DMX and Jet Li. And, again, you don't realize that you're really becoming a part of history. Like, I have not one picture on set, which is insane. And it's also stupid of me, right? But I'm like, could you imagine being on a movie set with, with, with DMX and Jet Li and not having one picture? I feel so stupid. But um, I wanted to design a project that definitely suited, you know, the movie and see the creativity of such. And I just called on folks that, you know, I knew that could turn up, and we put together this amazing soundtrack to win gold, and it was definitely a companion for, um, you know, this amazing now cult classic movie. And it was just like, I remember the days that it was just, you know, we were, we were out for, after like 20 hours on the set, right? And DMX is the type of person that, um, if he likes you, he likes to, but if he hated you, oh, my God. And at the end of the day, he was the type of person that if I moved or if I wasn't there, and it doesn't matter, like, if I could just be sitting there. He just wanted me by his side at, like, you know, at all those times. So I could just be sitting on the set, sitting in the trailer for hours and hours and hours, um, you know, because that was his comfort zone. And um, I'm just, just thinking back on those days, of this, you know, Jet Li and all of those Joe Silver movies, really. But but there were no, remember, at that time, he was, you know, a a, a star in hip-hop, but there were no, no rappers really headlining films. And he was a natural at it, and I was just in awe. And he would just get, he would come off the stage, be his cousin DMX self, go back. I'm like, you really, he really learned those lines. Can you imagine? Like, he really learned those lines. And I'm just, I'm just impressed by him. But I, but back to the soundtrack, it was just about, you know, the culture at the time and what we were able to represent. And I'm grateful that that soundtrack went, um, went gold and plus at the time. And I got to say, it definitely was a phenomenal soundtrack as well. Like it was loaded with such amazing songs and, and artists like Eminem, Obi Trice, Fifty Cent, CNN. Foxy Brown, Joe Joe Budden, like just the list goes on of just like the stack roster on this particular record. Could you imagine? And I, get, I want to give a shout out to Randy Acker, um, who is um, I still work with Randy Acker to this day. Um, you know who helps put that together as well. And my staff at Bloodline, um, just amazing folks that you know were passionate about hip hop at the time. And I remember Fat Joe on that album as well. Am I correct? You you were, you could correct me, but. I remember reaching out to Fat Joe, who I think he is super awesome to this day. And I wish Fat Joe every blessing that, you know, that God has for him. He's an amazing dude, like another consistent gentleman. And I got to say, I believe he is on that record as well. Because I, I, when back in the day, I used to listen to this record, like, literally front to back, backwards, like, literally all the time. I, I think the song was called C2G. I, I could be wrong on that, but I know I do know he was on the soundtrack. I remember reaching out to Joe, like, you know, I remember that, you know, vividly. Some of the other stuff, like, I'm just, like, you know, foggy on, but I remember vividly reaching out to Joe, and I appreciate him, yeah. And also, as well, going away from the Def Jam side of things, from 2012 to 13, you were actually a VP of marketing at the legendary hip-hop magazine, The Source. I was wondering, how did you actually land that position with them? And, of course, what was it like just spending that year with, with that company? Amazing. So... I met Lonjell early on in my career at Def Jam, and obviously we became friends. And for those of us who um, are not familiar, Lonjell McMillan is the owner um, of the Source magazine. He is also the, the attorney on record for um, the Prince Estate. So you've seen him in the news lately because they just, you know, had this major win for the Prince Estate. But um, I met him because he, you know, was, was fortunate. Well, I, he was um, the attorney for people like Rough Riders, for people like Drew Hill, and we just became friends. And so um, there was a point where I just didn't want to be known as, like, the hip-hop girl, right? 
and I wanted to do other forms of marketing. But I always kept my hip hop projects, and I always kept relationships with these, um, you know, these artists, iconic Golden Era, the new rappers. I just love, you know, the music aspects of it, right? And so I remember that I ran into Lindell at a, um, at a. At a, one of the Rock the Bells concerts, right? One of the Rock the Bells concert stops. And basically, um, I was I was consulting at the time for Dress Barn. Um, they, they they own this, this store called Justice. I don't know if you guys had that in Canada. But basically, um, it was a, it's a retail store. So I wanted to, you know, do other stuff. I was consulting for them. Um, and they have, you know, amazing, you know, clothes for women and girls. And so, but I was also working EPMD for um, this Rock the Bells um, tour stop. And Landell said, hey, you know, what you doing? You know, I'm, we just, we caught up because I hadn't seen him in a while. And he was just like, yo, um, you know, why don't you come over and work with me here at the source? And I'm just like, you know, I thought about it and I thought that it was a great transition kind of like back into hip hop, um, you know, full time. And, you know, it was an amazing year. We, at the time, we were in the same building as Puffy's um, Daddy's House studio, and it was just an, everyone came through there every single day. And um, we were fortunate enough to do, like, during my time working with Kim Osario and working, um, you know, with that amazing staff that he had at the time and really, like, you know, making these hip-hop covers for true lovers of hip-hop. And just to be, you know, in the source at the time, taking pictures in front of that source wall, working with artists and creating, you know, more business on the on the other side, you know, creating activations, creating 360-degree marketing campaigns for companies like Colgate, um, you know, was, was definitely a great experience as well. And I, I left, um, when I left the source magazine, I became a professor, right? And um, I, I'm a, even though they call me the hip-hop professor, I'm a real professor in real life, right? And um, I, I, I wouldn't say that I transitioned, but I left the source. Um, I became a professor for a school called MCNY in New York, and um, I taught in the media management program and basically um, teaching students how to get into the music industry right up my alley. And then from there, I was able to, um, you know, teach at the Institute of Audio Research that taught that teaches students how to get in the music industry, and that's really how my teaching profession started. But that time at um, the source was a great time for me to reconnect with Lonzel, who is a, who is a dear family friend, but then also to kind of like, um, you know, exemplify who I am, who God called me to be, which is this hip hop person. <laughs> And I got to say, first and foremost, like, congratulations on that one actually becoming a professor, because that's actually huge, you know? It's not every day you get the opportunity to go from a place like Def Jam and, and, and Source Magazine to actually working in a school and just teaching uh, uh, teaching the next generation. So definitely congratulations, and that's actually awesome. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And um, I don't know whether you saw it, but most recently, and I, and I tell this story story to me, right? And you never, I, I never woke up and was just like, oh, I'm going to be, you know, this full-time professor. I'm going to be, I just, you know, follow the path that God laid for me and I'm grateful for it. And I just, it, it gives me encouragement to turn up. So, I became, for those of us, you know, who listen globally, um, I'm from um, Queens, New York originally. So, I taught at a school after I left, um, MCNY, or, you know, kind of like, you know, during, I became the administrator for Monroe College in New York. So for about eight years, I was in the classroom teaching urban students marketing, um, teaching them social media marketing, entrepreneurship, intro to business. And I really, you know, it became a, like an amazing experience. But what happened was um, I always teach from the pra practical experience. Like I teach kids, you know, Um, I 
most recently, um, a gentleman by the name of Julian, who uh, we worked together early on. He was like an intern at Jeff Jam um, years and years ago. So he gives me credit for like you know giving him his first opportunity. But now he is the literally the only um, minority. Um, head of business and legal affairs to a record label in the world, Warner Music. And he had this vision of this Warner Music, right, uh, center for music business, Levotnik Center for Music Business, and actually um, went to Warner and they awarded Howard University, both of our, both of our al- alma mater, right? Um, we both graduated from Howard University and um, we had this huge and beautiful center in the School of Business, and he hired me to be the director of this center. So it became this full circle moment, and um, I'm just so excited because today we um, fully announced or officially announced that we awarded 20 students um, $25,000 partial scholarships, and my goal and my job is to get kids in the music industry. So it's a full circle moment for myself It's a full circle moment for, you know, Julian Petty, but for us, you know, for us to have this, you know, budget to to do the work that we've been doing for the past 30 years has been a blessing. So because, you know, uh, know, no one can really do what I do in terms of having these hip-hop stories, having, you know, marketed these iconic hip-hop legends, but then also I got a real degree in real life, and so I, I can teach. And just I get excited for being able to, you know, meet these kids at this educational and entertainment crossroads. And I got to say, I actually saw that actually in your uh, Instagram story. And I got to say, it definitely is phenomenal. And while we're on the topic of this, how do uh, individuals or parents uh, sign their children or teenagers up actually for this program? Like you have to go through the school itself or how does it work for one to actually get taught by the legendary Jazz Young? Oh, my God, I didn't even look at it that way, but thank you. Oh, my gosh. So, basically, we are the Warner Music Blavotnik Center for Music Business, and we are located, um, you know, in the School of Business. So, the scholarships are awarded to graduating seniors, right? So, you can be undergrad, grad, or JD, right, law school seniors that are graduating from Howard University and seeking to gain employment in the music business, right? And um, on the flip side of that, we do have a grand big center um, on the campus, and all students of Howard University um, are invited and, and, you know, can come in at any time to get mentorship, to ask questions, to get lessons. And we've also launched a monthly lecture series. That monthly lecture series is, you know, happens on various days of the month, but we've invited, like, all music industry executives that, you know, uh, are passionate about giving back to the next generation. So the community, um, you know, has been welcome, and it's just been a great success so far. So, you know, we have a lot of components and a lot of rolling, you know, moving parts, you know, as a part of the center, but no matter who you are, you can definitely always get support in that way. And the goal, you know, originally um, or most organically, the the goal is for, you know, us to train students that become these change makers in the music industry and definitely kick down more doors, break uh, break up those glass ceilings, and be social justice change makers, but then also come back and, and give the next generation of bison and community members a hand. And I have to ask, because obviously you're you're very infused in this actually right now and whatnot, but I have to ask, what is next for yourself aside from this Warner Music program? Like, what is next for yourself, Jazz Young? Is there anything we happen to miss during tonight's broadcast that you do still want to talk about? Well, we still got you here live on the airwaves this evening. Yes. So I'm a, a mama of two beautiful, fly, handsome boys, 17 and 11. Shout out to Francisco, shout out to Jackson Trinidad, and I am honored and proud to be their mother. So the first thing I want to do is continue to make them proud of me. That's the first thing, right? And then I want to say um, the second thing is to assist them and to help them to find their dreams, find their passions, find their goals, and to help them soar. 
And I also think that for me personally, I just want to, you know, get into a, a, a 100% peaceful, happy zone where I don't have to, like, hustle, hustle, hustle all the time. And I'm being honest and transparent, right? I also see myself traveling the world and continuing to speak, teach, and lead in the areas of hip-hop and education. I want to continue to serve my community, um, you know, individually, but also through my sorority, Delta Sigma Theta sorority, and just make sure that I exemplify what God wants for me. And I'm grateful and open to whatever path that is, but I'm like, God, you got to give me multiple millions at this point. But I'm so grateful for, you know, I think that, you know, who I am and who I've become has been an exemplary of what he wants for me, what God and the higher powers want for me. Um, but at the end of the day, I just want to continue to change lives. I want to continue to, you know, be a positive figure for some and, you know, a mother to, you know, to some and, 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 and a happiness to others. And at the end of the day, I think that, you know, on the, I want to say professionally, I definitely have a, um, a, a trip to, to L.A. on my to-do list so that I can start to delve into the film and TV world, and I'm excited for that as well. And also, Jazz, this is the time of the interview quickly that I give a chance for the individual that does slide into the radio station airwaves. Just a chance to give, like, shout-outs to whomever they want to give shout-outs to, but most of all, your social media handles. That way our listeners can follow you and stay updated on not, not, not only the amazing program you currently got going on, but yourself, Jazz Young, as well. Absolutely. So my Instagram is, and across the board, is I am Jazz Young. I am Jazz Daisy Young, Y-O-U-N-G. Um, also, my other Instagram is The Hip Hop Professor. I would love to see you guys on there. I said I was going to start to put more content on there as well. And I just want to shout out God. I would like to shout out my, my, my handsome kids again. They are so fine and fly. Um, and I'm just so proud of them in this time period because we obviously, you know, had a transition in our lives and, and moved from one state to another. And they, they are scooping it out. And I'm super proud of them. Um, I would like to shout out Warner um, Records executive. Mr. Julian Petty, for assisting us with this transition and having the vision to create this Warner Music Center. Uh, I want to shout out, you know, just some great friends of mine, um, Sydney Margison, uh, Sarissa, Darcelle Lawrence, who is the president of Visionary um, Entertainment. So she's a, the lovely lady who um, is responsible for Tales, right, on BET. And I want to thank you for having me. I appreciate you. I love you, and I look forward to, to seeing you in person one great day. And um, I would like to shout out your fans, Hip Hop Forever. Um, I would like to shout out Ontario, um, Canada, and I look forward to visiting you guys when I get back there again. And then I, I want to just tell a quick story about Ontario. And I believe it was Ontario. We shot another season. We, we shot another DMS movie up there, and I remember um, – going to Steven Seagal's house um, where he lived with 12 months. And I remember him serving us a vegan meal. And I remember um, playing spades with DMX and Omar X. That was all in one night. And if I'm not mistaken, the movie was Exit Wounds. Because I actually remember, it was I think it was around the Toronto area because... I remember, I watched the movie so many times, and when you watch a movie so many times, you, you tend to kind of notice things that you aren't, that you are not supposed to notice. And I remember I, watching this movie, I was telling my wife this, I was like, did I just see a Tim Hortons in the background? Because they were doing a car chase, I forget the exact scene, I think it was DMX on a bike, I'm like, I swear to God I just saw Tim Hortons, that is only a Canadian thing. So I, I literally paused the movie and started rewinding it very slowly. And then I actually saw the Tim Hortons right on the main street. So I looked it up, and I realized it actually was uh, in the Toronto area. Toronto. Okay, God. I knew it was Canada. I remember spending days and days in Canada, yes. So, and I like Canada because you guys have, um, you know, different health and beauty products that we don't get here. So shout out to Canada for your health and beauty products. I got to say, shout out to America as well, because you guys have a lot of things. And I mean a lot. I mean a lot of things that we don't have here in Canada that I really wish we actually had in Canada. So hopefully yeah, all your amazing stuff actually comes across the border here as well. Yes, yeah, the same. And thank you so much for having me. 
And I will. I hope that this interview was awesome. It was everything for me. And thank you so much for doing your history, for, you know, asking me, you know, challenging questions. I'm so excited. And uh, call me anytime. I got to say, Jazz, you are most certainly welcome. I'm glad you definitely enjoyed the interview. And, of course, call me anytime as well. You have my number. My line's always open for you. Blessings and have a great day in hip-hop forever. Most definitely. All right. Good night, guys.